So we will go ahead and get started. All right, so hello everybody. Good afternoon. Um, thanks for joining us today for our Pikes Peak Library District Medicare Lunch and Learn. This is our second in our series of Lunch and Learns. And today we are gonna be talking about active employment and Medicare. This is a um, about a 15 minute presentation and then I will open it up for questions. Questions can be asked by either typing into the chat box or um, at the end of the presentation, you'll be able to unmute yourself and simply ask your question um, over the air. Hopefully, and I sent out an email earlier, but forgot to include the attachments and I just tried to resend all those attachments. So hopefully you guys got that email. They will, those attachments or those handouts will be available on our website, as well as a recording of this presentation after um, we're done here today. Um, probably be posted as early as tomorrow. So um, if you didn't get the email, you're welcome to either let me know or um, go to our website tomorrow and be able to download them as well. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Again, today we're talking about active employment and Medicare. But we're going to start with who we are. So my name is Roma. I'm with the Area Agency on Aging through the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments. And the Area Agency on Aging's mission is to um, help older residents remain in their homes by removing barriers to independent living, by developing and coordinating programs and systems that um, promote that mission. The Area Agency on Aging serves three counties in the Pikes Peak region, El Paso, Park, and Teller. This is in partnership with our local Pikes Peak Library District. We've been in partnership with the Library District to present Medicare related information for several years now. And we are very appreciative of their partnership. And I specifically am with a program called SHIP, a State Health Insurance Assistance Program. This program is a federally funded program that's designed specifically to provide free and unbiased in-depth information and education on all things Medicare and all things related to Medicare. We don't sell anything. We don't endorse any specific insurance programs or products. We are true consumer advocates. Every county and every state should have access to a SHIP counselor or SHIP program to get Medicare information and education. This SHIP office at the Pikes Peak Area Agency on Aging serves a total of nine counties in Colorado. We've included our local toll, our local um, office number as well as the statewide toll-free number. If anybody calls from the statewide toll-free number, it will automatically route them to the SHIP office in the county closest to where they're calling from. So today's topic for Lunch and Learn is active employment and Medicare. And we're gonna talk about um, how the two intersect or don't intersect. Obviously, if you are still actively employed, but are approaching Medicare eligibility, um, there will be some decisions you may have to make about Medicare. And there's a lot of factors that need to be taken into consideration when making those decisions. So today we're gonna to talk about um, the fact that turning 65 these days no longer automatically means retirement. And many, many people in the workforce, as I'm sure you all know, um, are working beyond age 65 and intend to continue to work beyond age 65, you know, even as far as age 70 or longer, as long as they, as long as they can or as long as they want to. Because of that, um, it becomes more and more important to understand how the health coverage you may have through employment may or may not be appropriate to have with Medicare. And there's many, many different things to take into, uh, take into account for that or to factor into that decision-making process. So this presentation is primarily gonna be for people who are um, still gonna continue to be actively employed, 
board um, and that employer coverage covers themselves and or their spouse and dependents and are gonna be eligible or are enrolled in Medicare in the near future. We're also gonna be talking a little bit about how enrollment in Medicare, um, other factors about enrolling in Medicare, such as costs, premiums, um, who's covered, why they're covered, that kind of thing. So Medicare and, and the decisions you're gonna to have to be making um, when your Medicare eligibility comes about is whether or not to enroll in Medicare if you are still actively employed with group coverage. Medicare by itself, A and B, are the two primary parts of Medicare you're gonna to have to worry about enrolling in. Medicare Part A, for most people, if you've had a, um, a work history, you've had work in the past, and you've paid into the Social Security and Medicare income tax through employer uh, payroll taxes, for most people, Medicare Part A will be at no cost when you are eligible. Part A covers primarily inpatient services, such as inpatient hospitalization, skilled nursing facility care, that kind of thing. Part B of Medicare, however, everybody has to pay a premium for. Part B services are gonna basically cover all of your outpatient needs, office visits of any sort, um, outpatient uh, therapies, um, some home health care benefits, durable medical equipment such as oxygen, um, also covers preventive services. So anything that's not going to be part of an inpatient hospitalization is typically going to fall under Medicare Part B. And again, everybody has to pay a premium for Part B. That premium can vary from person to person based on income. When you're first becoming eligible for Medicare, whether it's based on turning 65 or due to disability at any age, there are some enrollment periods that you need to be aware of. The initial enrollment period is the enrollment period that typically surrounds your first eligibility into Medicare. Primarily, that's going to be um, the eligibility based on turning 65. So the initial enrollment period is usually going to be the three months prior to the month of your 65th birthday, the month of your 65th birthday, and up to three months beyond the month of your 65th birthday. That is your seven month initial enrollment period to enroll in Medicare without penalty. If you enroll in uh, Medicare during any of the first four months of that period, three months prior to and the month of, then your Medicare could start the month of your birthday regardless of what day of the, of the month your birthday is on, unless it falls on the first day of the month, um, benefits would start on the first day of that birthday month. Anytime after the first three months of the initial enrollment period that you enroll in Medicare, there may be a delay of one to three months before your Medicare would actually go into effect. <laughs> However, if you do intend to continue being actively employed when you become eligible for Medicare, that active employment, depending on the type of employment or the type of um, employer you have, may allow you to delay enrollment into any part of Medicare until that employment ends. At that point, you would have what they call a special enrollment period to enroll in Medicare. A special enrollment period would go into effect um, starting the month that the employment coverage ends and lasts for eight months. And that would be an eight month window to enroll in Medicare without penalty, <clears throat> regardless of when that employment ends. And then if for some reason you do not enroll in Medicare during your initial enrollment period surrounding your initial eligibility, you don't have the ability to take advantage of a special enrollment period or you miss your enrollment period for special enrollment, you can always enroll in Medicare any year down the road during the general enrollment period. The general enrollment period happens every year from January 1st to March 31st. If you're enrolling um, in Medicare during the general election period because you um, missed the other two enrollment periods, um, your coverage will begin July 1st of the year that you enroll and you may be um, assessed a, a penalty, a late enrollment penalty, meaning you might pay a slightly higher monthly premium based on that late enrollment and not taking advantage of the other two enrollment periods. 
So there are a lot of factors to take into consideration when determining whether or not you should or would want to enroll in Medicare when you become eligible for Medicare at 65, but are still actively employed. One of the biggest factors to take into consideration is the size of the company that you're employed with, because that is a, a, a big determiner as to whether or not you need to enroll in Medicare. So for most people, if you are gonna to continue to be actively employed and you work for an employer who has 20 or more employees, 20 or more employees, if you're turning 65 or already are 65 and the company you work for has 20 or more employees, that company's health insurance benefits that are provided to you through that work is considered a group health plan. Group health plans can include high deductible health plans um, with an HSA option, can also include shop marketplace coverage. If you have a, an employer with 20 or more employees in that situation, you are not required to enroll in Medicare at all. And regardless of what anybody may have seen online or what they have been told by agents or brokers or other, um, other people in the insurance industry, you are not required to enroll in Medicare Part A as long as you're actively employed with an employer with 20 plus employees. I know Medicare strongly, strongly encourages you to enroll in Part A, even if you are gonna to continue to be actively employed and a lot of their material suggests that you should enroll in Part A if you're gonna to continue to be actively employed, but you don't have to, it's not a requirement. And in some cases you may not want to. For example, if you are, um, have health coverage through your employer and that's a high deductible plan with a health savings account and you're contributing to that health savings account, if you were to enroll in Part A, you would not be able to continue to contribute to that health savings account. If you intend to retire down the road and you continue to trip, contribute to a health savings account in the meantime, you do need to be aware that if you delay enrollment in Medicare A and B, particularly Medicare A, now in favor of employer coverage so that you can contribute to an HSA account, you need to be aware that you should stop those contributions um, up to six months prior to the date you intend to retire and stop working. The reason for that is because you are not allowed to have Medicare and an HSA or be able to contribute to an HSA and have Medicare at the same time. You can still have the HSA once you're enrolled in Medicare and you're still able to use the money in that HSA for qualifying expenses. You just can't continue to contribute to that. And what that causes is some tax penalties. Are they huge tax penalties? I have no idea. I'm not a tax person, thankfully. But I know there are tax penalty implications or people who contribute to an HSA within six months or during the time that they have Medicare Part A. Now that six month window that, that you should stop contributing is because if you work past your initial eligibility into Medicare and you work more than six months past that eligibility before you retire, when you enroll in Medicare Part A, they're actually gonna backdate that six months. Once you're eligible for Medicare Part A, especially if it's at no cost to you because you paid your taxes, um, you're able to enroll in Medicare Part A at any time for any reason. You can still be employed, you can be ready to retire, but because because you can enroll at any time, for some reason, Social Security backdates that six months if you're beyond your six months from initial enrollment. So just something to be aware of, that you should stop contributing to an HSA um, up to six months prior to the time you ret retire if you are more than six months past your initial eligibility. Now, if you are less than six months past your initial eligibility, so say you say you turn 65 in October 
and you intend to retire for January 1st. You're still actually within an initial enrollment period, your seven month window of initial enrollment. And they're only gonna backdate that Medicare Part A to the first day of the month you would have turned 65. They can't go back beyond that. They can't go back beyond your actual eligibility for Medicare. Um, so just things to keep in mind um, when it comes to HSAs. But again, you're not required to enroll in Medicare when you become eligible for Medicare, whether you're working um, or as long as you're working and have employer coverage. Your employer cannot require or try to incentivize you to enroll in Medicare when you become eligible at 65. As long as you are still actively working, your active employer coverage should not change at all and cannot change. It's as if the employer has no idea that you've become eligible for Medicare, they're not allowed to by law. So they cannot require that you enroll in Medicare and they cannot provide any incentives or encouragement for you to enroll in Medicare. They are required to continue to insure you as if nothing has changed. If you delay enrollment into Medicare based on the fact that you continue to work and have employer coverage, again, with an employer of 20 or more employees, that delayed enrollment into Medicare does create that special enrollment period of up to eight months to enroll in Medicare without penalty when that employment stops. Now, if you work for a company with fewer than 20 employees and you're turning 65, it's a different story. Companies that have fewer than 20 employees can require that their employees that are becoming eligible for Medicare enroll in Medicare. Employer group coverage for smaller employers can be much more expensive. Um, and Medicare does allow them to drop employer coverage for employees that are becoming eligible for Medicare. Because of that ability for the employers to make that requirement, if you delay enrollment in Medicare in favor of your employer coverage, that employer coverage is not gonna be considered creditable to allow that delay. So if you do delay enrollment into Medicare in favor of your active employer coverage with an employee employer of 20 or, or less employees, and you go to enroll in Medicare when you stop working, you may be penalized for late enrollment. And you may have to wait for the general enrollment period to make that enrollment. So people who work for employers with 20 or less employees probably should enroll in both Medicare A and B. And Medicare A and B would become primary to the employer coverage. You can keep the employer coverage and Medicare at the same time, but depending on what it's costing you as the employee, it might not be to your financial advantage to do that and you might decide it's more cost effective to just drop the employer coverage altogether and keep Medicare. Cost um, out of your pocket may have a lot to do with what kind of decision you make in these scenarios. If you're paying a lot of, of premium for your employer coverage, you are definitely gonna wanna look at comparing the costs of Medicare and Medicare coverages to the cost of what you're currently paying for employer coverage in a smaller employer or even in a bigger employer, as well as the costs of out-of-pocket um, for services received under both of those kinds of insurances. There may be advantages if the employer coverage is half decent coverage, um, even if it's secondary to Medicare, you would want to talk to that insurance or your human resources department about how it might coordinate with Medicare if you keep both. Medicare would be the primary payer in that situation, but depending on what kind of coverage you have and what kind of out-of-pocket costs you have with the employer coverage, it may be able to pick up some costs Medicare left over. Then again, it may not. So those are the things that you would want to address with the human resources department of the companies that you work for um, to determine whether or not it'd be worth keeping both A and B of Medicare and the employer coverage or just A and B of Medicare. 
for people who are becoming eligible for Medicare who are under age 65, based on um, being determined disabled by Social Security usually, the rules are a little bit different. So if you are under age 65 becoming eligible for Medicare based on disability, the employer coverage that you may have, whether it's your own employer, employment employer coverage, or you're covered through your spouse's employment employer coverage, the company that that um, you or your spouse has to work for must have more than 100 employees before you would be able to choose to not enroll in Medicare and still get a special enrollment when that employment ends. Now, an important thing to remember for people under 65 who are becoming eligible for Medicare is if you're becoming eligible for Medicare based on disability, Medicare does require that you take Part A, the hospitalization benefit. And that's for a couple of reasons, primarily because it's gonna be at no cost. But the secondary reason is because if you don't enroll in Medicare Part A, you also have to forfeit your disability income from Social Security. The two are tied at the hip, so you can't have one without the other. So people who are becoming eligible for Medicare based on disability don't usually have the option of deferring both A and B in favor of employer coverage. They're required to take Part A. Because of that, you're gonna look more at coordination of Medicare and employer coverage. Again, if the employer has more than 100 employees, that um, under 65 person becoming eligible for Medicare can delay enrollment into Medicare Part B. But again, we'll have to enroll in Medicare Part A. Medicare Part A would be secondary to the employer coverage. And when that employment ends or that employer coverage ends, there would be that special enrollment period of up to eight months to enroll in Medicare Part B. If there are less than 100 employees that are are covered under an employer coverage for someone under 65, it goes the other way. So if there are less than 100 employees, then you're probably going to want to enroll in Medicare, both A and B, because Medicare would be primary to the employer coverage. The employer coverage would be secondary to Medicare. Now in either of these scenarios, if the employer coverage includes drug benefits. Even if you're required to enroll in A and B or need to enroll in A and B because the employer plan would be secondary, if that employer plan includes a drug benefit, you can delay enrollment into Part D. And when that employment ends and that coverage ends, then you would have a special enrollment into Part D for drug without any penalty. Same goes for companies with 20, less than 20 employees for people turning 65 or over 65. Even if the employer coverage makes you enroll in Medicare A and B, you may not need to enroll in Part D if it includes drug benefits until that employment ends. And that would be a special enrollment to enroll in a Part D for drug at that point without penalty. So, because if, you, if your company has less than 100 employees because you're required or should enroll in both Medicare A and B, when that employment ends or that coverage ends, there would not be a special enrollment period if you delayed enrolling in Part B. So if there's over 100 employees, you can delay enrollment into Part B. If there's under 100 employees, you should enroll in both A and B to avoid any penalties down the road. If you're becoming eligible for Medicare based on end-stage renal disease, the rules are different again. So if you're becoming eligible for Medicare based on end-stage renal disease at any age, and you have employer coverage either through your own employment or spouses, the size of the employer does not matter. What matters is that that employer plan, that employer coverage will remain primary to Medicare 
for up to 30 months. That's called the 30 month coordination period. So in all honesty, because the employer plan must stay primary for those 30 months, you can actually delay enrollment into Medicare. Even if it's Medicare based solely on the fact that you have end stage renal disease, you can delay enrollment into Medicare A and B during that 30 month coordination period. When that 30 month coordination period expires, then you're gonna to need to enroll in A and B because A and B will become primary and the employer plan would become secondary. There may or may not be advantages to having both an employer plan and Medicare in both in, in that scenario. When Medicare is primary, um, Medicare is obviously usually going to pay the majority of your medical expenses and may end up paying more or having less out of pocket costs than an employer plan. When the employer plan is primary, having Medicare may have the advantages of of picking up some of those costs that the employer plan left over. So if you have an employer plan that has a $6,000 deductible, if you have to go into the hospital, but you have Medicare A as a secondary to the employer plan, Medicare A would pick up most of that $6,000 deductible, everything except for the Medicare Part A deductible, which is $1,484 this year. So there can be some advantages to having Medicare secondary to an employer plan in any of these scenarios, but maybe not so much an advantage to have um, the employer plan secondary to Medicare. And again, because there are so many different scenarios and the rules are different under each scenario, this can be really, really confusing. So it, um, it's something that we always encourage you to talk to your human resources department about, and hopefully they can help you understand what's required, what's not required, and how it may or may not coordinate with your current coverage. Other things that we're gonna uh, take into consideration or that I think you should take into consideration when it comes to choosing employer coverage um, versus Medicare or with Medicare is who you are covering under that employer coverage. If you're covering only yourself, that decision could be a much easier decision. But if you're covering yourself as well as spouse and or dependents that are younger and need to have that coverage through your employment, that may make your decisions a little more complicated. <coughs> Typically, if you are covered in their employer coverage, become eligible for Medicare and would prefer to drop that employer coverage, but you have spouse or dependents on that employer coverage, you aren't usually allowed to drop your employer coverage and still keep them on it. So without you being insured, they cannot be insured either. The exception to that though, might be a COBRA. So if, um, if you were to drop employer coverage in favor of Medicare and that causes your spouse and dependents to lose their eligibility for coverage, they may have the ability to get onto COBRA continuation coverage for up to 18 months um, based on that loss of your coverage. And we talked about COBRA a couple of months ago in our first lunch and learn. Other things that you might wanna take into consideration or factor into your decision-making process, costs, cost, cost, cost. Um, depending on what you may be paying out of your paycheck in premiums to have coverage through your employer and or to cover spouse and dependents, because that's usually a, significantly, a, a significant additional cost, you're gonna to wanna to look at the cost of having that employer coverage versus the cost of having Medicare and Medicare related coverages. Um, you can look at one or the other or what it would cost to have both at the same time. If you pay a premium um, for your dependents and spouse, but there's no premium for you to be on the employer coverage by yourself, it may be um, worth looking at having Medicare in addition to the employer coverage. You also would wanna look at the cost uh, that you have to pay out of pocket when you use the insurance. So employer plans are wonderful to have, 
but sometimes those costs can be rather high. That you may have a large deductible with your employer health plan. You may have um, high co-pays with your employer health plan. Um, maximum out of pockets are great, but those are usually very high as well. $10,000, $15,000 is not unheard of as a max out of pocket with employer plans these days. Those costs can be significantly higher than the cost of having Medicare or even the cost of allowing Medicare to supplement the employer coverage. So depending on what you're looking at in that regards, you might wanna take and do some number crunching to see where you might come out ahead, having employer coverage only, having employer coverage with Medicare or dropping employer coverage in favor of Medicare. If you choose to have both employer coverage and Medicare, do keep in mind that, again, as long as the employer has more than 20 employees, if you're turning 65 or more than 100 employees, if you are under 65, Medicare would be secondary to the employer coverage. But again, depending on what kind of expenses the employer coverage um, provides for you out of pocket, there may be advantages to having Medicare secondary. If the employer plan would be secondary, it's really a much, a much more difficult decision to try and figure out if that employer plan would pay any benefit after Medicare has paid the majority of your medical needs first. And you would also want to check with your human resources department as to whether or not that employer coverage would even coordinate with Medicare in that situation. So a lot of information in a very short window of time. And this is just the most simplified uh, version of this information that I could put together for a 15 minute presentation. Um, certainly if there are any more specific questions that people have about their own specific situations, that's what the SHIP program is here for. And that's what we're here to help you with. And we're always available to talk to anybody on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, we could do it over the phone, we can do it by Zoom. Um, one of these days we will be back in the office and we can do in-person appointments. But um, again, you're welcome to contact us at any time with any more specific questions about your specific situations and we're happy to help you try and untangle some of this information. This slide shows our contact information again. Um, you're also always welcome to email me with any specific questions. Um, or any um, additional information that I might be able to help with. And that it is- It looks like there's a question in the chat. Yeah, so let's go to questions. Again, if you have a question, um, so I'm gonna answer the chat box question, but if anybody else has questions, you can either type in the chat box or you can simply unmute yourself and ask your question. So let me address this question in the chat box right now. It says, what if you are employed and covered by TRICARE? That's a really good question. So if you are retired military with access to TRICARE, TRICARE absolutely requires that you enroll in Medicare A and B when you become eligible, regardless of whether or not you are currently working with employer group coverage through that work. If you don't enroll in Medicare, when you become eligible, you risk losing TRICARE benefits altogether. So unfortunately, um, that is an exception to the rule. You are absolutely required to enroll in Medicare if you wanna keep TRICARE if you're retired military. And you simply do that um, when you enroll in Medicare, when you become eligible, then you contact the DEERS office, you provide them with a copy of your Medicare card and TRICARE turns from TRICARE Primer Standard to TRICARE for Life, which has no annual cost um, and acts as a Medicare supplement. And quite honestly, you would not need anything other than Medicare A and B and TRICARE for Life that provides you with basically the best coverage available in this country today. But you are required, regardless of being actively employed with employer coverage, you are required to enroll in Medicare if you have TRICARE and want to keep it. Another question is um, when considering whether to keep employer insurance or drop that in favor of Medicare, 
does the employer plan usually include dental vision whereas Medicare does not? That's a good, that's a good um, point. Medicare A and B, original Medicare does not currently include dental and vision benefits. You may see commercials on TV about all these wonderful plans that include dental and vision and all these wonderful things that people didn't know they were entitled to. That is not original Medicare. Those commercials are talking about Medicare Advantage plans, which are insurance plans that have contracted with Medicare and Medicare allows them to offer benefits above and beyond what Medicare covers, which are dental and vision. So again, um, that's another thing to take into consideration is um, any additional benefits like dental and vision that you might lose with employer coverage in favor of Medicare because Medicare itself does not provide for dental or vision benefits at this time. So thank you for pointing that out, Mr. Dono. Uh, another question, if you wait for your birthday month to enroll in Medicare, how long is the delay before you receive benefits? One month. So if you enroll in any of the three months prior to the month of your birthday, your Medicare kicks in the first day of the month of your birthday. If you enroll the month of or the month after the month of your birthday, your benefits start a month later. You enroll two months after the month of your birthday, your benefits start two months later. If you enroll the last month of the month of your birthday, then your benefits start three months later. So the longer you wait during that seven month initial enrollment window, the longer it takes for Medicare to actually go into effect. And it looks like that is the last question in the chat box. Were there any other questions? Again, um, simply unmute. Yes, this is Elizabeth Wynn. Hi. Hi. So I have the situation where my husband um, enrolled in Medicare Part A because somebody told us we had to. <laughs> He's had employer um coverage with somebody over 100 employees this whole time okay now he's actually going to retire probably about a year from now okay can what do we have to consider about can we pick up a supplement um at that absolutely point? okay yeah absolutely so because he still does not have enrollment into part b he's able right. to that because his employment coverage. When that employment ends, he can enroll in Medicare Part B to be effective whenever he needs that to be effective. Or right. Enroll in Medicare Part B anytime while he's still actively employed. When the employer coverage ends, because that employer coverage will be considered creditable, um, when that employer coverage ends and Part B, A and B go into effect as primary benefits, that creates special enrollment opportunities into any other kind of coverage that you want to go with Medicare. So that um, when Part B goes into effect, that starts the six month window of guarantee issue into a supplement. It starts the three month window of um, opportunity to enroll in an Advantage plan if that's the choice you make, or a two month window of opportunity to enroll in a drug standalone drug plan. So we'll have all of those guarantee windows of opportunity once his employment coverage ends. Okay, uh, because I wasn't- He left out in the cold. Um, and then what, there's a significant age difference with us. Uh -huh. So he's going to end his employment, but I won't be eligible for Medicare at that time. What do you recommend for spouses uh, do? And I'm not working, I'm not employed, so. Um, where do we go to look for coverage for these? So, I mean, is, is there more than a couple of years difference between your age and your Medicare eligibility? Well, it'll probably be three to four. Okay. So unfortunately in that situation, you're probably gonna wanna look at um, marketplace coverage. Okay. Through the Colorado Health Exchange, Connect for Health. Right. Um, you could look at COBRA coverage based on losing his employer coverage, because I'm assuming you're covered under his employer plan right now as well. Correct. So 
when you lose his employer coverage based on the fact that he stopped working, you would have an opportunity to look at COPRA coverage, which would cover you for a minimum of 18 months, but could potentially, um, depending on the situation, be extended for up to 29 months. But that's okay. not, that may not get you to Medicare if, right. that, if there's more time in between than that. Otherwise, the marketplace is probably going to be your best bet um, to look at that kind of coverage. Okay. Um, and depending on the situation, you may qualify for the tax credits or premium subsidies um, to reduce some of the, the cost of, on the marketplace. Okay. Um, anything else to consider in supplement plans when you retire? Um, and my, mo my mother has Medicare Advantage and it's been okay, but it's a true HMO. Yeah. Um, so it's pretty limited. And, and um, so where, the time, yeah, ahead. so when the time comes, how do you shop to make sure you're getting the coverage you need um, for the, through the supplements? Because, you know, he's got some pre- pre-existing conditions and things. Okay. So when it gets closer to him actually retiring, right? Um, give us a call. That's what we are here for. Okay. People understand how those options work, what those options are. We can usually provide you with a list of all the companies that offer those options. Okay. Um, give you an idea of what those costs look like. And again, he'll be guaranteed issue based on losing employer coverage. Um, okay. Well, pre-existing health issues shouldn't be a problem. Okay. But yeah, no, you're more than welcome to give us a call and we're happy to talk to you about all of that and provide you with some additional information about what's available in Colorado specifically. Well, but, that would be great because, yes. you know, the insurance agents know what they know, but they also have an interest in what you do. And that is exactly the whole point of this program, the SHIP program, is that because we're not selling anything, we have no interest in what decisions you make. That, that's how we are true consumer advocates, here to simply educate you and help, help you decide what kind of things are important to you so you can make the right decisions for yourself. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. I did get another question in the chat box. Um, if you are retired and enrolled in a uh, federal employee health benefit advantage plan and Medicare is the federal employee health benefit primary. Hmm. So federal retirees, federal employee retirees or employees who are getting ready to become eligible for Medicare that also is kind of an exception to the rule. Federal employees have their own retirement system and their retirement system does not necessarily require that they enroll in Medicare in order to continue with the health benefits. But they do also offer um, health benefits specifically tailored to their Medicare retirees. So if someone is enrolled in a federal employee Medicare Advantage plan, which which the federal benefit system offers, that federal employee advantage plan um, would be the primary payer. If it's the advantage plan, and when I see the word advantage plan, I'm assuming Medicare is part of that equation because advantage plan, that terminology does not apply to non-Medicare um, coverages. If someone has Medicare and enrolls in the Federal Employee Advantage Plan option, the Advantage Plan is primary. That is their Medicare coverage at that point. If they choose to not enroll in Medicare at retirement, um, they are allowed to keep their employer coverage as if they are still employed. And that is, that is a, an exception to the rule most employers will not allow you to keep your employer coverage once you're no longer employed and they may offer retirement benefits they may not but federal retiree system does allow people to maintain that employer coverage as if they were still employed 
So would Medicare be secondary then in that case, Roma, or would it, or not? It's an advantage plan. It's irrelevant. Medicare. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. I'm their Medicare. So to be enrolled in Medicare and have an advantage plan through FEHB wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. Well, they have to have Medicare to enroll in the advantage plan. Through well, that's right. They've got to have it. So the same requirement for an advantage plan for FEHB is the same as the requirement for a Medicare advantage plan, which is you have to have A and B. For the most part, yeah. Again, they get to play by slightly different roles, but yeah, an advantage plan is an advantage plan. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Roma, Scott Tunnell here. Hi. Hi. Um, in one of your earlier slides, you had said Medicare Part B premium depends upon income and when you enroll. Yep. Now, I understand the income part, but could you elaborate on the when you enroll part of that? So the when you enroll would be dependent on whether or not you're enrolling during your initial enrollment period, or if you miss your enrollment period and are stuck enrolling during a general enrollment period. Because people who are limited to enrolling during a general enrollment period are doing so because they missed either their initial enrollment or they didn't um, take advantage of a special enrollment. So they basically missed out on their guarantees and are now limited to enrolling during the annual enrollment period, which usually comes with some sort of penalty, late enrollment penalty to their premium. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Comments? Again, if you weren't able to get the slides that I tried to email right before this presentation, please let me know. You can shoot me an email um, at my email address here and I will be happy to resend them because I sent the original email saying that there were attachments attached and I forgot to attach them. So I'm not sure I... I quickly tried to reattach and resend the email, but I'm not quite sure if it went through because we had to start the presentation. So if you did not get that, please feel free to let me know. But also keep in mind that um, both this recorded presentation as well as the attachments will be posted to our website, um, hopefully as early as tomorrow, and you'll be able to download the attachments and or view the presentation at your convenience at that point. All right, well, if there's no other questions, again, thank you very much for joining us today. I hope it was useful and informative. And again, you're always welcome to contact us if you have any additional questions or if there's any other information we might be able to provide to you, or if you're simply interested in just a one-on-one -on -one consultation to talk about your specific situation. Thank you, Roma. It was a great, great, great presentation. Appreciate it, thanks.